Thank you for joining us tonight. The Rockland Arts Festival is pleased to welcome you to studio tour night. We're going to be meeting with four great artists that are going to be taking us around their studio. This, uh, please stay muted during the event and write your comments or questions in the chat. Um, you can actually write questions in the Q&A if you wish. This is the third annual arts festival and we have 130 participating and nine free online and in-person events. This is our last online event of the festival. Um, please visit the festival website at www.rocklandartsfestival.org to see the outstanding work and learn more about, well, this doesn't apply anymore, learn more about the upcoming events, but you can still go and see the wonderful work. Uh, before we get started, I would like to thank our wonderful sponsors, Arts Rock, Patso's Law, On Main Street Insurance, and Glitter Thicket Cafe. We couldn't have done it without you. Please check out their links on the festival website. Um, okay, so Lisa already told the artists to put the, your social media and website links in the chat. Uh, so let's get started. First up, we have Dan Lukens. Uh, Dan has been involved in the arts since childhood, including drawing, painting, and sculpting. Most of his working life has been dedicated to human service and advocacy for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, whom he attributes much of his inspiration. So Dan, take it away. Well, okay. Uh, Michael, just if you could uh, enable the screen share, please. Oh, sure, yes. Okay. Okay, there we go. So, so thank you, Michael, for that very kind introduction. Uh, this is my very brief, but hopefully interesting take on a personal artistic journey. Uh, my paintings are mostly about ordinary things and familiar places. If you walk the south end of Tallman Park, you're drawn to the river view beyond the trees. But if you take the less traveled trail to the west, you can see these beautiful marsh ponds. It's an extraordinary but often overlooked place. In my work, whether it's a local street, a backyard, a familiar panorama, or a night out. The hope is that it'll remind you of something personal and hopefully familiar. As a young man, I went to art school and I really wanted to be an artist and to learn how to draw. But as Michael said in the introduction, mostly I made my living in human service and it wasn't something I did instead. It was something I had no less a passion for. It was a personal mission. But about 12 years ago, I came back to my painting and I came back to it with a passion. And this is kind of when I started my love affair with the things I saw around me. It wasn't all landscapes, I tried different things. Some of them were kind of whimsical. Some of them were kind of dark. But mostly they were about familiar places and the themes in ordinary life. So painting then became my happy place. It really wasn't something I did because I wanted to be an artist. It was something I did because I loved doing it. But it also became a way of connecting with my community. And I enjoyed uh, doing exhibitions and meeting people and being part of a community. And so wherever I went, that became an excuse to take in the things I saw around. A trip to jury duty, you know, which is usually the most horrible thing you can think of in your life, became an opportunity to create new artworks. 
So whether it was a trip to the city or Florida or whatever, or some other local place, it became about taking in the things around me and recording them and sharing with them with the people around me. But again, mostly the things I fell in love with were the places right next door. I learned that people hate deer. I've never been able to exhibit that picture of a deer. As soon as somebody in a gallery sees it, they said, everybody hates deer. The way I paint is I usually paint like three or more paintings all at the same time. Uh, it just has to do with um, my technique. I paint layer upon layer. So this is a brief clip of me painting. And so if this works, we can, we can have faith in technology. This is where I paint. This is my workspace. It was originally a hot tub room. I have a basement room where I can work on the canvases and stretch one or frame one if I have to. It's a little noisy with the furnace. But the thing that's wonderful about it is it's right off my living room so I can kind of live with the paintings while I'm working on them. So you'll forgive me because for some reason with the video, the slide won't advance. So I'll have to do it manually. Okay, I'm sorry. So these are some of the people I love. And uh, you know the paintings I make are not all about things I show in a gallery. Some of them are family. And these are my three wonderful daughters and my grandson. And I also have paintings of my granddaughter, of course. And my recently departed father and my brother, uh, who's very close to me. And this is a, this kind of, this painting is really more of a family story than it is anything else that I won't go into, but it's very personal. And um, my wife, Mary, hates virtually every painting I've ever made of her, but I said, me painting her is just the cost of being my favorite person. What I will tell you though, is she finds endless pleasure in this pseudo self-portrait where I've cast myself as a grumpy old man. Go figure. So I'm currently exhibiting at the Union Art Center with Lori Lieber. So I very much hope you'll come down to the art center and see the paintings. It's a beautiful space. This is my website, uh, my, uh, website address, danlukensart.com. It's pretty intuitive. This is the invitation to the show. So now that you've seen it, you're all invited. So I hope you come to the reception on March 6th. Roost is a wonderful restaurant. And I'll just share this little piece at the end. So this is the, the gallery. This is Lori Lever's work. She's a wonderful photographer. And this is the gallery. And uh, there's all kinds of arts events down at Roost. So I'm going to stop sharing now. And as I said, Michael, I worked very hard to get through this and to respect the other artists and their time. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much for sharing. That was great. And hopefully everyone will go to the art reception on what March the 6th, right? Yes. Okay. And you just, you can confirm that on my, on social media or my website. Okay. So we have, we have some questions and, um, oh, Aviva has a question. I'm actually going to put her on the spot because I am not sure how to pronounce that. So you, you can ask your question. <laughs> All right. So what I was asking was, um, hi, Dan, if hi. you paint on plein air ever, or do you always paint from photographs or how do you do that? Yeah, you know what, Aviva, I learned to paint plein air and I always painted that way. But in more recently, what I do is because it's kind of a, it's spontaneous about the things I say. I usually take a picture with my phone and work from that now. And I kind of adapted that method in more recent years because I wanted to, uh, the thing about plein air is 
where I'm, you're kind of limited is um, I paint in layers. Okay, so you know, I, an oil painting technique um, it gets pretty muddy if you try to mush all the paintings together in one layer. Okay, and so what you do is you paint for a while and then you put it down. And I haven't really found a way to plan air that way. Um, <laughs> so no, I usually work from a picture. Absolutely. Okay. And is the opening at Roost or is it at Union? Well, Union is, Roost and Union are the same thing. Um, oh. The gallery for the photographs is, is in the restaurant downstairs, but there's a second floor gallery that's open on the um, weekends. So okay. Yeah. I've, been, I've, I've, I've shown there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Th that makes sense. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you very much. So next up is David D'Astilio. David's current body of work consists of objects that exist at the intersection of the mystical, ecological, and the techn and the technological. Technological. <laughs> Stories and mythology give us purpose, yet it's our objects that tell the human story. So, David. Hello, um, welcome to my studio. Um, uh, this space is, uh, I kind of use as uh, the starting off point for most of my projects. And uh, most of my work starts um, digitally with 3D modeling, uh, sometimes 3D scanning. So uh, even my drawings, my sketches, some, I, I keep a notebook, but most of my work starts in the computer. Um, and then when I talk about the technological, the whole process of my work is taking something that begins in the computer and making it a physical object. So that means 3D printing, CNC machining, robotic milling. Um, so here in my home studio, I have a small tabletop 3D printer. You can probably hear it working now. I'll show you in a, in a minute. Um, and then my, I've had a few different day jobs, uh, including teaching um, at William Patterson University, but um, also set design. And uh, my main job in set design is, you know, art directors will bring drawings and I'll draw them in 3D and then program a robot to carve uh, those shapes. And so that's a, a big part of uh, my personal artistic practice, as well as uh, what I, as my day job. Um, let's see. Um, so as for the, the themes um, that were mentioned, yeah, mythology, ecology, um, uh, I like to bring the mythology in with some of the, the forms I use. Uh, I like to draw on art history, uh, which go into uh, mythology a lot and kind of take things that have done before and rearrange them, smush them around a little bit. And uh, ecology is something that I, like to take some material. Some of my work you'll see has some unique materials. Um, so I'm gonna just give you a little physical tour of this of the studio right now. So we'll start with some of this um, something ecological. So we have up on the ceiling. Let me turn this one off. Up on the ceiling here, we have forms that are arms and a pineapple. So these were made by 3D scanning and robotically milling. And then 
molds were taken of those, and this is cast mycelium. So that's uh, mushroom spores and corn husks molded into those sculptures. Um, and so all these works are from 2016 to now. The, the, that's one of the earlier ones. Um, a more recent one, this one was actually displayed at um, Palisade Center at the, at the gallery. Um, and that's a uh, cast iron, uh, sun and moon scythe. The inspiration for that was um, the, the oil painting, it's called Bringing in the Mistletoe, the Druids. Um, here's my 3D printer going. It's first doing some exploration for some new work. It's not much right now. Um, here's a cast bronze. It's a more recent work that I'm working on. You know, kind of seeing what the human body can be turned into. And uh, these are some 3D prints, some castings made from a 3D print and then cast in ceramic and um, Raku uh, fired. Um, we're going a little bit chronologically, but not totally. This piece is a cast bronze hands and a robotically milled carved wood handle. The hands are scans of my own hand, 3D printed and then cast. Um, see materials are kind of a thing I like to play with. This is a 3D print is the bottom part, the white part. And uh, the top is uh, robotically milled wood. These are portraits of my kids. Um, there's a self portrait. And then this is my most recent work on the wall of these wood sculptures. Um, as these were shown this summer uh, at the Fitzgerald Gallery in Westchester. So we have Atlas and a Neanderthal skull, Buzz Light, I mean Buzz Aldrin. Uh, that's Artemis. Um, and this is another kind of recent work. This is Zeus and Poseidon. It's kind of a, a big net. These are 3D prints. Um, these, this is kind of a play on the human body. They're finger drills. Um, so some of this is playful. I have a cast iron bell. It's pretty heavy. I still have to figure out how to hang it. And that one's carved foam. I still have to make a mold to cast it. So there's some various states of progress. On these works, but that's that's where I'm at now, and um, I'm starting to get ready for, you know, making a new body of work this year. Um, and if there's any questions?
questions or turn it back over to you guys. Yeah, we have one question. What is robotic milling? Okay, so um, CNC milling is a machine that has like a drill spindle that spins very fast and it can carve foam. Uh, you know, they have different machine, different CNC machines for different materials. But robotic milling is when that type of spindle is attached to a robotic arm like you would see in a car factory. And um, so that's the type of machine I work with pretty much every day. Um, that's what robotic milling is. Um, and another question, uh, do you actually do the drawing on a computer program? Yeah, I use, um, I use a few different programs. I use Rhino uh, 3D, um, Blender, Cinema 4D, um, occasionally a couple others, but those are the main, main programs I, I use. Uh, we have another one. Uh, how did David start doing 3D art? Um, well, so I started with art when I was uh, a child. Um, I, I was inspired by my grandfather, who was a painter. And then in my 20s, I started exploring stuff other than painting. My undergrad, I focused on painting and then started to explore 3D. And then when I went to get my master's degree, they had uh, uh, the robot and 3D printing and I really dove into that digital side of my artwork uh, when I went to grad school. Uh, another question. Do you do your own mold making and casting? Um, I do. I do sometimes and sometimes I um, will hire someone but uh, a lot of the things I've cast I've done at uh, Ramapo College um, when uh, I've done like an exchange when I was teaching at William Patterson uh, with their department doing some of the CNC stuff they would bring some of their classes there and I would bring some of my classes to Ramapo. But now I continue a relationship and we, you know, I help them out. And then in exchange, I get some, I get to make something for helping out their class. Okay, and one more question. Do you draw or carve anything by hand? Uh, yes, uh, drawing uh, is, uh, what got me started in art. So I, I, I still sketch frequently. Um, and I have a sketchbook with me all the time. Uh, hand carving um, is part of all the things that come off the machine still need work. So I, I, don't, um, I don't usually start with a raw block, um, but I do uh, a lot of finishing work uh, by hand. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So um, next up, uh, we have Janice Kowalski. Uh, she is an organizing expert who will now give us some helpful tips on keeping our studios in order. Janice? Hello, so thank you for having me. I promise what I'm gonna say will be less than five minutes long, but if anybody does wanna take you know, some notes, maybe you wanna just grab a quick pen and paper and, um, and I'm gonna start. So um, the tips are gonna, so I'm, this is all about organizing your arts, crafts, hobby supplies, and your materials. And being artists, you all start with a fresh canvas. You are masters at making beautiful creations from your mind and your gifts and your talents. You all have the ability to transform your workspace to suit your own style and needs. So know that being disorganized will drain your creative energy. As much as it may pain you, 
and it may seem overwhelming to organize your art room, the benefits of tackling the chaos will be worth your every effort. Start with a deep breath and calming music. Think of three things that you are grateful for or have gratitude for on the day that you start to organize or every day actually. This practice helps you feel more positive emotions and makes you feel more optimistic and positive that you can master and achieve anything that you want. Have a treat or something fun to reward yourself with as an incentive for when you are done. It could be as simple as taking a walk in nature later, ordering dinner, or putting your feet up and watching a great movie. All right, it's time to get started. To begin with, Remove all broken, dried up old supplies and other items in the room that you are no longer needing. Get rid of all that stuff that does no longer, that doesn't serve you. Once all of the unnecessary stuff is removed, recycled and thrown away, it is easier to begin tackling the room. Always remember, less is more, and the more you remove from your equation, the easier it is to organize the remaining important items in your art room. Always group like things. Pencils, brushes, tubes of paint, canvas, charcoal, clay, markers, colored pencil, pencils, sketch pads, etc. Labeling and alphabetizing are the key to one's organizing to success. You do not need a fancy label maker as you are all artists and you could write or symbolize what's behind each of your own boxes and drawers. The size of your space that you work in even if it's small, can easily work. They make rolling cabinets that are designed for drafting and art, and those little rolling cabinets can be a key item in your space. These carts come in plastic, wood, and a range of sizes and prices. Stacked drawers, um, stacked drawer storage is ideal for keeping things neat and contained and great for scrapbook, scrapbooking, sketch pads, and other art supplies. If you are in a small room, you can consider taking the door off the closet, add a clip on light, add some wire shelves to store your labeled boxes, and it helps with your paper supply, hardware, and accessories to be in your view for quick and easy access and availability. You can hang pegboards and hooks and brackets in your room, and you could make, this is something that um, I thought could be helpful since you're all artists, Make, you can make and hang an inspirational vision board to keep you focused and on target for what you want to make and do and achieve in your life or in your art room. Vision boards are a collage of images, pictures, dreams, words, and affirmations. This visual helps keep you inspired and motivated. Do you know that a vision board helps you increase your understanding of what you want to accomplish and it helps you meet your goals? So, that's just, you know, that's one little fun thing that you could, you know, even though you're artists and you have your own niche, you could still look up at your vision board, which could have an array of other things in, incorporated in on it. So if you're lacking furniture in your art studio, you could pick up on Facebook Marketplace or anywhere else, an armoire, cabinet, or any other cheap or free piece of furniture to add to your room to assist you with keeping supplies contained and being behind closed doors. Covering old pieces of furniture, like converting old pieces of furniture is fun and clever and it's a, you know, you have a plethora of uh, art supplies to jazz up that furniture, even if you just found it on the side of the road. You could, you know, make that a focal point in your room as well. You can try to have a large plastic covering uh, board to work on. You could try to work on one piece of art at a time. You could try to clean and put things away at the end of your day, and this will prevent the room from getting messy and feeling out of control. Cleanliness and good lighting is always essential. And on the back of your door or any door in your home, consider hanging hooks. These hooks can hold your smocks, bags, and other art supply items. Small bookcases can help with storage as well. And you could store finished work in acid-free containers or boxes, stackable trays, or space savers too. Always keep your room well ventilated and be mindful to keep all toxins, solvents, and rags out of the reach of children or pets. And always dispose of your hazardous items safely. That is it, folks. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Lisa was kind enough to invite me. Um, I wish I was talented like all of you. I really appreciate all your art and uh, you know your gifts and talents. So I'm enjoying the show. 
I'm just one to do some writing and talking, but that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janice. Um, we do have a question and you can let us know and you can also put it in the chat. Um, which stores do you recommend for organizational items that are reasonably priced? Believe it or not, you could find some organizing things in the Christmas tree shop, Walmart, Target. It doesn't have to be anything expensive. I know people always think that the container store is the way to go, but honestly, you could even go to like secondhand shop or like I said, just go online and see, go to Craigslist free and just see what people are giving away. Again, being artists, you could you know, take a piece of furniture or something and, and really convert it into something that will meet your unique needs. So it doesn't have to be anything fancy or expensive. Less is more, even in that regard. You don't, you don't have to spend a lot. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so next up we have Mike Melandra. The desire to create and inspire has been the guiding force in Mike's life transcending his life's journey as a photographer, artist, and martial arts instructor. The professional tools all vary, but the motivation remains to help others feel connected and inspired. Okay, we're set, we're all ready for you. Um, all right, great, can you guys see that? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, so I guess, um, start is how I got involved in art photography and all that other great stuff. Um, I went to school for architecture and uh, I always had a, um, a desire to design, create, and put different types on paper, um, but I didn't like sitting in an office. Um, I was training in the martial arts for many years and what I always wanted to do was open a martial arts school. So I did that and went full-time with my martial arts school and about 17 years ago, I started to revisit my creative side with the arts by taking watercolor classes with a gentleman by the name of Arthur Gilmore here in Rockland County. And um, I would go to his classes and I would bring magazines from outdoor magazines, National Geographic, um, all these magazines with these big scenes of the Grand Canyon and Zion National Park. And I would say, Arthur, this is what I want to paint. And in the beginning, he was like, OK, we can work on this. And about three, six months in, he said to me, Mike, you need to put the magazine down. You need to buy a camera and you need to get out there and start shooting your own visions and put that on paper. I want to see an interpretation of what you shoot on paper um, with, your, with your paints. So I said, all right, I'll go get a camera. So I picked up a camera. I went out and started shooting. And one thing led to another. And I realized, wait a minute, I have a knack for this photography thing. And um, I'm gonna keep moving with it. So I guess whatever, 15, 17 years ago, uh, my first show was at the Suffern Library in, uh, in uh, Suffern here. And from there I moved forward and right now where I'm sitting in is my gallery in Suffern, which is across the street from Danina's restaurant and my martial arts school is in the back. Um, so what I'll do is I'll go through some of my images that I shot, I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, and uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer anything at the end. Um, so this photo that we're looking at now, I had shot in uh, Kauai. Uh, the problem that I had the first time I went out to shoot in a place like Kauai was I got very overwhelmed. Um, I'm sitting on the beach with my camera, sunset isn't doing what I thought it should be doing, and I got in the car, drove to another location. Didn't happen there, I got in the car, drove to another location. Well, I spent two days chasing the sun, and then I finally realized that's not going to work. I need to stay in one location. And what I need to do is capture whatever happens. And this image, when I shot it, I was very unhappy with it. I got back home. I brought it into a Photoshop and I started to manipulate the color by pulling uh, the color out of the mountains and the sky and leaving it in the foreground. And this is what I came up with. And then this photo has won um, a couple of awards and it's one of my best selling images here in my gallery. Um, so it's, this trip really taught me to be patient and it really taught me that what you have to do is look at things from many different angles and uh, have an open mind. This is another image from um, Hawaii. This is a red sand beach in Maui. Um, I've been there a couple of times. I've shot this numerous times. This is another shot that I sell here in my gallery. Um, this is the Hanalei Pier in Kauai. Um, this was a color image I shot um, middle of the day 
when it was very, very uh, bright and the contrast was very high, but I was able to pull it off because of the shadows and then convert it into black and white. This is um, Maui. If you've ever been to Maui, there's, an, there's a road called Road to Hana. The Road to Hana basically circles around Haleakala, which is the uh, volcano on Maui. And this is at the end of about a five mile hike. This is a path that goes up to a waterfall. This I shot, this was uh, about an hour after sunrise. This is the Hanalei Pier at sunset when uh, the sun was just starting to set below the mountain and I was able to get those sun rays coming out over the pier. And what really makes this image in my mind is not necessarily the landscape, but it's how the people on the pier are interacting with the landscape and the sunset. I really thought um, that really made this image pop. This is the same uh, pier that I shot on the same night. I'm sorry, a different night, um, see same location. The next night it was crazy colors in the sky. So whereas the first night, there was basically nothing. This is uh, St. John, uh, drove to the end of the road, the end of the island. Uh, my wife and I got out of the car. Um, we walked down to the beach. I look off to the right and I see this trailer, an abandoned trailer and right off of the, the beach from the trailer was this rowboat and it just, instantly caught my eye. And when I sat down and looked at the scene, I saw the rope leading to the boat and I knew that was gonna be the leading line to this picture. This is also one that I sell quite often in my gallery. Um, this is Antelope Canyon in um, Arizona. I spent quite a bit of time in Arizona. I have a uh, townhouse in Sedona that I go out to quite often. I periodically run photography workshops out there and it's kind of like a jumping off point for me to go to all the other locations out in the Southwest. This is uh, Moab. This is um, the LaSalle mountain range. Um, it's about, I'm gonna say 45 minutes outside of Arches National Park, if anybody's been there. Um, great location, directly across the street from this is the Colorado River. This is another shot from Antelope Canyon. And interesting, interesting, uh, interesting enough, when I went to Antelope Canyon, I didn't want to go to this canyon and shoot. It's um, one of the most photographed spots in the world. And I kind of want to shoot what people, what other people don't shoot. I want my work to be different. But my wife, Sue said, no, Mike, you need to go here and shoot this canyon. It's iconic. We need to go. So I set it, I set it up where we went and it was a photography trip where I was with, I think, five other photographers. Now, the crazy thing with this location is you look at this and you think you're in the middle of nowhere. Standing behind me were more people than there would be in rush hour in the subway system of Manhattan. And because I had a, I was with a photography group and I paid more money, they got me and all the other photographers up front. You sit down, you set your, tri set up, your, your tripod up. The gentleman on the tour takes a bucket of sand and he throws it into the light. And when the particles start to raise and rise up to the top, what you get are these incredible light shafts. And that's what, uh, this photo is here. So I basically had uh, one shot to shoot this photo and uh, I had about two minutes to get this photo and I was lucky enough to get it. This is another one that I sell here in my gallery. Uh, this is the Grand Canyon at sunset. I shot this image a couple of years ago when I was on a photography workshop with uh, I think it was Clarkstown South uh, High School. Nancy Diamond, who is a school teacher, was a school teacher there. She's retired now, um, ran the art department. And she was kind enough to get me to go on a trip with them where I was the photographer um, teaching all the kids how to use their cameras. And we went from uh, Bryce Canyon, Zion Canyon, the Grand Canyon to Vegas, and we flew home. We did this all in five days with, I, I want to say, about 10 teenagers in a minivan. It, it was what an epic trip. It was great. This was one of the shots uh, that came out of that trip. Um, this is Sedona. This is just. This, all, all of Sedona looks like this. So I, I wish I can say um, this is like a special spot in Sedona, but Sedona is, the whole place is special. And wherever you look, this is what you see. So I was basically out hiking and um, turned around. I saw this scene in the middle of the day and this is what I was able to capture. This is another shot from Sedona. What I did with this image was I took uh, all the color out of the sky and I kept the color in the foreground and the mountain. And I really liked the contrast and the depth of field I got from the black and white image uh, with the sky. And 
actually this image didn't really do much with the um, with the sky and color. But this way, it really seems to accentuate and bring out what the focal point is. And that's what's called Cathedral Rock. This is um, Horseshoe Bend. This is outside of Page, Arizona, and it's very close to Antelope Canyon. So basically, to get this shot, you have to walk to the rim of the canyon. And you're literally standing. Your toes are hanging over the rim. It's a thousand foot drop down to the bottom, which is uh, the Colorado River. And you got to shoot with a wide angle lens. You got to set up your tripod so your camera's hanging over the edge. And you're basically standing there, hoping you don't fall. And this is the, uh, this is the capture you'll get if you shoot that. This is a close up of Bryce Canyon. This is another one I shot on that trip with the, um, with the high school kids. This is another close up of um, Bryce Canyon. Um, what I really liked about this shot was uh, all the lines different colors, the contrast, and how vibrant it was when, um, when the sun starts to get just below um, the rim of the canyon. This is Antelope Canyon also. This, um, believe it or not, was not very, wasn't manipulated at all in Photoshop. This came right out of the camera. And really all I did was uh, punch up the shadows a little, but this is how, how amazing the light is in that canyon when, um, when it reaches a certain point of the day. And this only happens for a couple of hours throughout the day and only uh, for a couple of months out of the year. This is another shot from, um, from Sedona. Um, this is another shot from the Grand Canyon that was shot at sunset. I blurred out, if you see the foreground and kept the detail in the background to kind of draw the viewer's eye into the canyon and to make you feel like you're standing on the rim. This is uh, just a, a van that I saw in um, Jerome, Arizona, which is right outside of Sedona. And uh, I shot it because I thought it was really cool. And this, I sell this image in tapestries and I sell more images of this in tapestries to college students than I sell of my fine art photography. Everyone loves this shot. Um, right, so coming to the other shots coming up. This is Harriman. This is off, off of, uh, if anyone knows Harriman State Park, the, the area up there, this is off Kanawaki Circle, um, basically right off the side of the road. This is another one in that same area. And um, what I was going for with this is if you look up in the top, the sunburst with the, um, with the sun coming through the trees. This is Tiarati Brook Road. Um, I go up to Harriman quite often to shoot. I do a lot of hiking up there. I run and bike up there. One day I was up in the park in the fall and I was running down um, uh, Tiarati Brook Road. And I said to myself, wow, this would make an amazing picture. Didn't have my camera at the time. So I went back up the, about three or four times before I was able to get this capture. And um, uh, just everything worked. It was right after a rainstorm. The rain kind of brought out the contrast and all of the colors. It saturated the front of the road. And um, by uh, doing a shallow depth of field in the front, it really brings the viewer in and makes them feel like they're standing on the foot of that road looking down. This is uh, another one. This is um, Stony Brook, which is right off of Reeves Meadow. Um, this is about a mile and a half, two mile hike um, from the parking lot before you get uh, to the trail point where you go up to Pine Meadow Lake. Um, this is Sterling Forest. This is a um, mountain biking trail, I believe. And what they did was they put down these walkways because this area gets very saturated with water um, for the mountain bikes and the hikers. This is another one off Tiarati Brook Road um, that I shot um, back on a trail about four or five miles into the park. and. Um, this is an image I, again, I didn't really think was gonna make much. I brought it home, I put it into the, uh, uploaded to the computer, put it into Photoshop. And to my surprise, uh, I had something that was pretty awesome. Another one from Harriman, this is the Stony Brook also. Uh, this, this here could be bone dry. And in the summer, early summer, spring, after um, the thaw, the winter thaw of a lot of snow, this is how it runs. And um, even runs higher and faster than this at uh, certain times. So I'll show you a couple more images and I'll be more than happy to take questions from people. Um, this is a winery in Wurzburg, Germany. My wife's family comes from, uh, mom's side of the family comes from Germany and they're in a town called Rondesaka, which is right outside of Wurzburg, Germany, about an hour from Frankfurt, uh, the major city. 
So we did a wine tour. Um, we went into the basement where they had these wine barrels and with my camera in, this, in a low lit situation, I was able to pull this image off, which I really didn't think I was going to be able, uh, be able to pull this off. But this image also hangs in Torn Valley Vineyards here in, uh, in Suffern in their wine tasting room. This is uh, the bowl down in um, uh, Wall Street. I went back to this about three times and I finally realized I had to get down there before sunset to be able to get a picture of the bowl with nobody in the image. And there were actually people there and they were kind enough to step to the side and they let me do my thing. And this was the uh, end result. So I'll show you one more image. Uh, let's see what it is. Okay, this is Iceland. This is just a church off the side of the road. Um, two years ago, I did a trip to Iceland with two other photographers. We spent seven days, I think, eight days uh, traveling around the country, just the, the three of us and a guide. And he took us to some like exquisite, amazing places that it just, you can't believe that it, that exists on, uh, on our planet. It's just amazing. Um, all right, so I'm not gonna bore anyone with uh, other photos. If anyone has any questions, I'll be more than happy to, um, to answer them. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, we have two questions. Um, what type of camera do you use? Um, everything you saw here that I, that I shot was shot with a Canon 7D, which is um, not a full frame sensor camera, but um, for what I do, because a lot of what I shoot uh, is on a tripod, I didn't need a full frame. So um, I was using that camera. I recently upgraded to Canon's R6, I think it is, which is a mirrorless. Uh, camera and I'm just starting to play with that now and um, I'm starting to do a lot of macro photography and a lot of uh, other types of photography that I wasn't doing with my other camera but all this was shot with a 7D camera. Okay and the second question is uh, there is there a location you'd like to to photograph on your wish list? Um, yeah two locations the my main location is um, I want to do a couple of things. I want to go to uh, Tibet and I want to shoot the culture. I want to try to set up where I do something in some of the schools there and teach children how to use um, their mind to create, whether it be painting, drawing, or photography. And then I also want to go to um, Mount Everest Base Camp where you can do a, um, a cleanup effort up there. So I would like to go up and do something there with photography, document what goes on up there, and then also um, donate my time and, and, and clean up an amazing place that unfortunately um, gets dirty. So that, that's my main trip. And then Africa, and there's a lot of other places. But if I had my choice, it, it, would, be, it would be Tibet. Okay, uh, we actually have two more questions. Um, do you still paint? Yes, I still paint. Um, my paintings have gone from, um, well, actually, if you wait a second, I'll pull one over. I don't know if you guys can see this. So I've gone from painting landscapes and painting um, scenes that I can shoot with my camera to painting stuff that comes out of my head. So I'm doing a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, abstract work, a lot of stuff that go, is along the lines of uh, different types of mandalas, geometric shapes, and um, bright colors with both acrylics and uh, watercolors. Okay, and one last question. What do you hope to inspire to, uh, what do you hope to inspire others to do? To think outside the box, be creative, take chances, and to never take no for an answer. Because every time you fail at something, that's part of the learning process. And the second you stop, that's when you lose. You keep moving forward, eventually everything you do is gonna to come to what your success would be if you don't quit. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Is there, uh, is there something that um, you got to stop sharing the screen? Oh. Um, there it is. 
Okay, good, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And next up, our last guest for the night is Maria Teresa Ortiz Nereto. Maria Teresa discovered her passion for art at the age of nine when she painted her first oil on panel. She has developed an intriguing technique with palette knives, cold wax, and oil. Her canvases are colorful, are colorful with a predominantly flat surface. So Maria, Teresa. Okay. Um, hello, hello, Michael. Hello, everyone. And welcome to my studio. So I will try today to walk through what I do every day. Um, from the moment that I enter to my studio, what happened, what I do, what the things that I, I try to accomplish every day, and how the idea that is in my mind come into fruition. So let's start from here. I usually enter for this door that you see here, and I stop, I have some quotes on this wall, but I always stop in this one. And um, I think um, this is quite uh, what I intend to do in every single of my paintings, um, because my paintings, even, even though they are, they are telling a story, are quite autobi are autobiographical. There are things that I, maybe don't share with everybody, but they are in my paintings. So I always remind this a quote from Paul Eluard in which I am really looking at myself in every single canvas. So um, after that, I start with a ritual. Every single day I start 